Here to break it all down, Robert Costa is a national political reporter with The Washington Post, joining us from Capitol Hill. At the table, Nick Confessori, political reporter for The New York Times, former Obama campaign manager and deputy chief of staff in his White House, Jim Messina's back, and Karine Jean-Pierre, senior advisor at MoveOn.org, called back into service. We didn't get enough of her yesterday. Robert Costa, please bring us the latest and greatest from Capitol Hill this hour. A few minutes ago, Nicole, I asked Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, what's next? What now after these two votes have failed in his chamber, the chamber he runs? He was, as usual, stone-faced, no comment. But if you watched him on the Senate floor in the last hour, he was huddling with Republican senators. Senator Schumer, the Democratic leader, just said McConnell has called him to his office. So now, because these bills have failed and the Democratic proposal got more votes in a Republican-controlled Senate than the Republican proposal that the president supported, it's now time to negotiate based on my conversations with senators. What you just said is so important, Robert Costa. The politics of this have been clear as day to those of us who cover politics in, in a crisis like this. The president's wall, more unpopular than the president, the president, more unpopular than the Democrats. The president's bill today got fewer votes than the Democratic bill that would have reopened the government. Just underscore how damaging that is for the president, how much that weakens him moving forward in these negotiations. It does. And the reason for that is someone like Senator Cotton of Arkansas, a conservative on immigration, said no thanks to the president's proposal. To him, it's too moderate to have these kind of protections for the DACA recipients. At the same time, senators like Mitt Romney of Utah, Senator Collins of Maine, Senator Portman of Ohio, and Senator Isaacson of Georgia, they're part of this bipartisan discussion that's going on. They say it's time to get the government reopened, so they're okay, more favorable to the Democratic proposal, just as a way to open up the government. The White House's leverage here is on the, is on the brink, and you have House Democrats, the Speaker, saying, we're going to move forward with an offer to the White House on Friday. Five billion in border security measures, not a wall, but border security measures, just to see what the president does now that these bills have failed. Robert Costa, one more for you. A source close to the president telling me today that Donald Trump's capitulation on the State of the Union, something he values more than just about anything else, television time, was the first sign of surrender in his uh, observations. It's a fascinating relationship, Speaker Pelosi, President Trump, two people of the same generation. The president usually likes to use bullying tactics to take on his rivals. But in uh, Speaker Pelosi, he has someone who has been in the trenches of political war, policy war, in discussions for decades. She brings a tough capital to her negotiations with the president. And he sees in her, based on my conversations with White House officials, a formidable opponent. Robert Costa, Kareen, using the perfect word, is, it, it, Donald Trump's tactics are all bullying tactics. Mm -hmm. And if there is one thing about Nancy Pelosi, she will not, she cannot be bullied. Right. She has bested smarter men than Donald Trump in her political career. Smarter, savvier, uh, more strategic, uh, certainly than Donald Trump is. And not only that, Donald Trump was bluffing yesterday. And clearly she was not. She was not going to allow her to, herself to be intimidated by Donald Trump. And honestly, what we're seeing right Right now is Nancy Pelosi is Donald Trump's worst nightmare. And because she's and maybe not, the country's best hope. Exactly. I think that's a perfect that's the perfect way to say it. Because he finally gets a no. Somebody is finally saying to him, and oh, you are not getting your way. This is a divided government and we are a co equal branch. And so she is she's taking that on and she's not afraid of him. She's like I said, she's seen a lot worse than Donald Trump. Jim Messina, in talking to people inside the administration, they all privately describe dealing with this president, and I invite Robert Costa and Nick to both jump in if they're reporting deviates from this. In their private discussions, they talk about managing him and his impulses the way any parent talks about managing their child. But it doesn't spill over into public. Publicly, they, they, they try to fall in line behind what he, what he seems to want at any given moment. Yep. Pelosi's strategy seemed to be to treat him like the child that he acts like and to go public with that. Yeah, it's a really smart strategy, and I agree with Kareem. She's not someone to be trifled with. She knows exactly who she is. She's going to go straight at him. You know, when you have kids, you realize very early in preschool that you learn impulse control. Mm -hmm. President Trump doesn't have any impulse control, and he's always about tactics. Nancy Pelosi can play the tactics game, but she also can play the big picture game and understand how to get this done. But a place you and I used to work for a very long time, the U.S. Senate, while Pelosi and Trump are wailing away at each other, the Senate's going to be 
a place where they cut a deal and try to figure out how you move forward. And so it Are you is sure. I mean, there's no reporting that suggests that Donald Trump sees an end to the shutdown as an imperative. No, but I think you brought up the best point. I worked in the Senate for 15 years. The amount of times the minority bill got more votes than the yeah. majority bill, yeah. you can count on one hand. That is right. unprecedented. And it is why the very first thing Mitch McConnell said was get Schumer in my office mm -hmm. and let's figure this out. I'm not saying it's going to happen quickly, right. but in a functioning divided government, which is what America wanted and now America has, right. the Senate is usually the place where you go to cut the deal. That's right. Yeah. And and it used to be that um, men and women, but, but men like Ted Kennedy and John McCain, um, both the late Ted Kennedy and late John McCain, used to be the people in the room that could do that. Is it is it within the sort of skill set of Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer to follow in that model? Oh, absolutely, in their skill set. I mean, what's happening here, though, is is a breakdown of American politics. Uh, yeah. in, in you can't you can't solve an intractable problem where there's no consensus by trying to solve it at the worst moment possible, mm -hmm. and that's on the CR. So what they've done is say, I'm going to hold this whole thing hostage to solve this one problem that we have not been able to solve for 10 years right. through periods of unified control and single control. You mean immigration? Yeah, it's been immigration. more than 10 years. George Bush addressed more the nation on years. immigration yeah. with the support of John McCain and Ted Kennedy in 2005. Mm -hmm. But here's the deal with Trump. Like, look, Pelosi is not uh, a condo buyer and, and she's going to be back. <laughs> like, I think the president sometimes does deals the way he did in, in the private sector where there isn't any repeat business. And if he gets the better of somebody, he can go on with his life. That's not how this works. This is repeat deal making with the same people over and over again. And she's looking down the road and she knows that if he lets him do this shutdown and get an unpopular policy through with it, he'll do it over and over again. It's bad for Democrats. Nick, if that that's happens. my favorite thing I've heard all day. Nancy Pelosi, not a condo buyer. Robert Costa, you have some fantastic reporting today about the role Jared Kushner, who still gets a lot of criticism from people inside and outside the White House for his lack of experience. Experience, and as the shutdown shows, if he's the point man, this is not going to end up on his resume. There's a fundamental disconnect in how both sides see this. Jared Kushner has been meeting with moderate senators, Republicans and Democrats, and arguing that there's a big deal to be had. And he keeps coming to the president, White House officials tell me, and saying there's some kind of big compromise that he can cut, that he can bring his business skills and make this all end. But the House Democrats are sitting over there watching Kushner with a wary eye, and they're saying, what is Kushner talking about? <laughs> Nancy Pelosi, this House Speaker, is not going to let her members drift. The members are with Pelosi. The White House keeps trying to poach Democrats on the moderate side and, and invite them to the White House, the Problem Solvers Group, all of that. And the Democrats continue to hold firm. And, and the White House still believes the president somehow can get the Democrats to bend and get a big deal to happen. But Pelosi has framed, the Speaker has framed this in moral terms. And she's also said to her members, we have the leverage, do not bend. Kushner will just continue to offer things. Democrats privately tell me, Pelosi's the speaker's message is, look at what Kushner has continued to do and the Trump White House has continued to do. Put things on the table, like DACA protections. All we need to do, she says, is sit here and wait. And the president, um, you reported, uh, disparaged Jared, belittled him, said, oh, he's become an immigration expert all of a sudden. Tell us about that anecdote. The story leads with an anecdote where the president says, well, well Jared, you've become an expert on immigration in the last 48 hours. It's, we, we make it clear different White House officials have different characterizations of that exchange, but we're confident in the reporting. And it it's underscores how the president sees Jared as not only someone working on Jared Kushner working on Middle East peace. He's working on, he has issues con with the Russia investigation. He's working on uh, Mexico and trade policy, but he's also now the real leader, along with Vice President Pence and Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, on the shutdown. That tells you where this White House is at. Kushner, Vice President Pence, Mulvaney, that's the, the trio, the power trio, so to speak. Another way to look at that might be, this is where the White House is, is, is woefully understaffed, woefully yeah. um, uh, under-resourced, and even the president knows it's a joke that Kushner's in charge. It's unbelievable. Let's remember five days ago, only five days ago, Kushner's grand idea was to put the president out on Saturday to offer the House Democrats something that they didn't want and hadn't talked to. And now he's going to be the guy that fixes this? It's crazy. The other thing I think people need to remember 
For Nancy Pelosi, this is an imperative time to teach Donald Trump a lesson because we are going to be right back here in March again That's right. when the debt limit, uh, debt limit ceiling happens. We're going to be right back here. Trump's already said he's going to demand more money for the wall, and she has got to teach him we are now in divided government, and that's exactly what she's doing. Trump's playing tactics, and she's playing long ball. One thing I've, I've wanted to ask you since um, I saw this on uh, social media last week, George W. Bush, people that have served in the White House have this sort of institutional knowledge of just how dire and grave it is yep. with these agencies. Um, e even if people are having to go to work, and I understand lots of folks at the Justice Department, uh, it's not a complete um, shut out. But not being paid, missing two paychecks puts any person under great duress. You're worried about your spouse being able to buy groceries. You're worried about checks bouncing. You're worried about um, you, you know, rent checks and babysitters and whatnot. Um, w what else could be done to sort of make the point that this is deadly serious stuff? I thought that John Kelly, the president's last chief of staff, signing on to this letter about the security concerns, suggests to me that no one can pick up the phone and talk to Donald Trump. They can only speak to him through the media. But, but what else can they do? It's interesting. You now see today the airlines coming out, talking about similar things. The air traffic controllers doing this thing. Um, you know, John Kelly is teaching Donald Trump a lesson as well. The One of the best dishes in Washington, D.C. restaurants is revenge. <laughs> and this is him saying, hey, how you like me now? Let me just be very honest. There is no <laughs> I'm loyalty. I'm not sure it's served cold, though. It's what been right, two it's weeks. Right, piping hot. <laughs> right, exactly right. But, and it's also unprecedented, but he doesn't even have his former chief of staff on board right. here, right? And you're seeing more and more just normal people. You and I worked in White House. The one thing you don't do is screw with the national security folks, right? right? Bipartisan. <laughs> you do not screw with them. And these people, you know, 80% of America lives paycheck to paycheck. And you talk about he's screaming all the time, border control, border control. What about everyone at the airport? Ports. What about everyone at all these ports? We're, we're who are frankly doing their more jobs? dangerous people come through our airports. That's exactly. You're right. laughing. <laughs> no, I just think uh, it's absolutely right. And I, I, I think what's what's amazing about this moment is, and for everyone watching the show, um, it's not usually like this. And we're actually in this aberration. It, you know, we usually would have contentious policy fights separate from this process. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do this over a government shutdown. Mm -hmm. That has become the normal course of business in Washington. It is never what anyone envisioned as a way to handle these disputes. And it just goes on and on. I can't believe it. I don't want to skip over what Nancy Pelosi accomplished, because even making a round of calls to some of the president's allies outside the White House today, they were surprised that he capitulated on the State of the Union address. And, and I want to talk to you about what was happening in Democratic circles. Some people were critical of her. They said she's playing his his game by not inviting him. She was right. Do, was do right. Democrats have the stomach to be as steely as Nancy Pelosi? They better because the, we have her as speaker. I think she proved yesterday why she should be speaker, right? She proved exactly what everything that many of us were arguing and fighting back and forth, why she should be given the gavel again. Look, one of the things that Donald Trump said in his, um, in his statement was it's her prerogative, right? It's almost as if he realized finally, oh, wow, I do not have any power here. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, okay, it is your prerogative, and Maybe I will she can do get this. Him to but, read his PDB. Right. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It, it really shows her power, and she's a woman, and that's another part of it too. And she's she's his peer as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so all of that, all of that matters. But going back to John Kelly for a second, it shows how much of a weak hand Donald Trump has. Yeah. John Kelly was in the White House when the shutdown happened, and now outside of the White House, like two weeks later, he's saying, "Oh yeah, you need to end this." It's a great point, Robert Costa. We are living dog years. It seems like forever ago that this started, but I guess it was on the heels of Jim Mattis's resignation. And, you know, January feels like it's been 142 days long. But I'm going to ask you what my seven year old asks me all the time what happens next? What happens next? Susan, Senator Susan Collins of Maine told me she's going to stay here over the weekend, that she thinks senators have to come together, pressure Leader McConnell and Leader Schumer to, to work with Speaker Pelosi, to work with President Trump and find an end to this shutdown, to include DACA protections at some level, maybe change some green card policy, include billions in border security, but not a wall, and find a way to just go to the president and say, we've cobbled something together. Nothing else can pass the Senate or the House. It's time to put this on the floor, and it's time for you to signal you sign it.
Robert Costa, we're always grateful to have you, but your reporting on this has been awesome. Thank you for spending some time Thank with you. us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.